Hallelujah. We have uh, a really special guest. Uh, we have two special guests. Hallelujah. Do you, uh, do you want to introduce, Frizz, do you want to introduce uh, um, uh, our uh, special guest this morning? Someone yeah, that, someone Sot's, going, Sot's going first, right? Yeah. We have uh, Sot Scrivener. Um, who's just a really close personal friend of mine and um, someone who just really loves the Word of God. And he has a, kind of a heart message, a life message from the Song of Songs. And I'm sure he'll be sharing some from there today. And then we also have uh, Steve Hawthorne. Um, Steve has done many, many things in the body over the years. Um, a lot of it focused on um, prayer for the unreached. Um, he's produced prayer guides. Steve, I probably don't know all the things that you've done, okay. uh, but yeah. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get an introduction from you in a minute here. And okay. Grant, how long do we have for each speaker? We've got like uh, a little bit more than 20 to 25 minutes. Great, great. Just so wanted, uh, just wanted um, to say, can I... Can I just say one thing first? Just, yeah. just wanted to say uh, thank you to Sat, who has been a great host of uh, the leaders' meetings. You've really done a, a you, you just uh, so great to have you with us, brother. And now we get to introduce you. Hallelujah! <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, and for, for those of you who don't know Sat, he really carries a deep prophetic anointing. You know, and as we've come to know him and learn and appreciate his gifts, there's real sort of choice wine flowing through his spirit. So uh, we're in for a treat this morning. Hallelujah. Choice wine, as it should be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, the subject that I'm going to share on today is the preparation of the bride. And, um, you know, I think uh, with with so many prominent things that we have and we see in the word of God, sometimes they, they kind of stay in that almost catchphrase reality. And so my hope for today is to take a look at a couple of passages and try to take it a little step deeper and further into what are the implications or, or what a, how do we move forward with this, even in some very real life, you know, practical ways, I guess, is a way of saying how can it become integrated into, you know, our, our daily life and, and have an impact and an effect in our lives with the Lord and in ministries, etc. So um, to start with, I'm going to, and if you are someone who likes to line up your passages, um, you can put a bookmark in Revelation 19, uh, Philippians 3, and then uh, Song of Songs 2. Uh, we'll start with Revelation chapter 19 from verses 6 through 8. And so obviously, uh, this is in the, the culmination of the book of Revelation of the, uh, the end time events leading to the Lord's return. And in verse 6, um, John the Beloved says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself or to, array, to be arrayed in fine linen, pu fine linen, pure and shining, pure and bright. For that white linen, that fine linen, is the righteousness of the saints. And so here's where we get that, that concept of preparation of the bride. And I'd like to point out two quick things. In verse 7, it says that she made herself ready. And so some of the question I think that, that, that we should have is, well, how? How did she make herself ready? What does that look like? And how do I do it? What do I need to do to be considered made ready? as a member of this, this identity, the bride. And in the next verse, it says, 
that something was given to her. And so it was given to her. She received something as opposed to her having manufactured or done something in and of herself or aspired something. Her preparation uniquely is about receiving something, an impartation, receiving. And we, we would simply call this grace. It is, and, and one thing that we can take away and, and start to rightly interpret this concept or, or identity of the bride is this bridal identity is the culmination, the, the, the purest and highest culmination of what it is to be a new covenant believer. That means that entering into that reality, uh, you know, because of that fact, entering into that reality is exclusively on the terms of the new covenant. And so what we find is we find that we need to not just, you know, over and over Paul warned in a, in a number of places that having begun by the spirit, we ought to walk by the spirit. Or in other places like Galatians, he warns believers who started with receiving through grace the empowering of the Holy Spirit and the, the gifts of God, the gifts of salvation. People who had begun through faith to receive those, but then had gotten off course and began to develop some type of hybrid reality by which they were now coming to depend on their own righteousness, their own efforts, their own perspectives. And it was leading them in a divergent path away from what the intention of the new covenant was. And his warning at the end of Galatians is, don't be deceived, God's not mocked. If you sow according to that reality, you're going to, to, to take a harvest of decay and destruction. But if you keep on this reality from faith to faith, grace upon grace, from strength to strength, from glory to glory, all coming out of faith and grace and understanding in a deeper experiential way those realities, then of the Spirit you will reap eternal life. And so our first takeaway here is the preparation that comes to the bride, if it ever turns into something beyond just a phraseology that we use in prayers or sermons, phraseology that we that we uh, can cheer about, you know, we can get excited about, in order to actually have its purpose, which in Revelation we see it's required for these end time events, the pressures, this intended purpose that, it's, that, it, that it has, we must enter in through faith, by grace, upon grace, upon grace, that reality enlargening and extending into our walk in a more full way. And so and we, we see this demonstrated. We see that we'll, we'll go to Philippians 3 now. And what we see in Philippians 3, at the beginning of the chapter, Paul kind of illustrates this reality using different language. In the beginning of the chapter, Paul talks about how much, how, how excellent he was as a Jew. As a Jew, he was the top of the class. His righteousness exceeded his peers. He was found uh, blameless according to the righteousness that is found in the law. He had a zeal and a determination and an education and a knowledge that was bar none. He was right up there. And then what, what we do is we get to that second part of Philippians 3, and we'll pick up from uh, verse 8. So with those things in mind, Paul says, yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Let's pause here because what I, what I see is the biggest hindrance to this bridal reality in the body of Christ is us having come on to that slightly divergent path where we begin to operate in, in this hybrid reality that's partially funded in our soul through our own efforts, our own aspirations, our own um, custom package of, of how we should behave, um, trying and striving in our own strength to achieve righteousness or morality, you know, to overcome sin, these, these types of realities. And 
here Paul is saying, I have been there. I've been to that reality. And he's now talking to Christians, giving them an exhortation, saying, I've been there. And why is he giving it to Christians? Because we're prone to go there also. And he says, look, I've counted all of that as rubbish so that I can gain, I can apprehend Christ to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be con being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And he says, it's not that he's already got a hold of that. It's not that he's at the culmination of his faith, receiving his glorified body already that he's perfected. But he says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And he says, brothers, I don't count myself as having apprehended it. But he says, it's one thing I do. He says, forgetting the former things behind me and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward for the goal, for the prize of, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what's he saying? What is he boiling down and saying here? He's saying, Christians, you believers, you people in the body of the Messiah, in the congregation of heaven, I am exhorting you to to not just look at this as an initiation or starting by faith and through this realm of grace. You have to start and complete and continue through that same reality so that the, the manifest reality of what we call the bride, her being clothed in righteousness, not just a lot of translations you'll read say righteous deeds there in Revelation 19, but the word there just has to do with, is just righteousness. And so righteousness covers a, a much broader context, not just the, the things that we do, but the emotional makeup of our heart, our values, our virtues, um, how we experience and think about things, the renewed mind, all of these things are accompanied, uh, are, are included in that garment that's given to her. You know, Psalm 110 calls it in the beauties of holiness. The army of God arrayed in those beauties, the majesty of his holiness. And what, what we can understand that is, now that we've been justified, we've been made righteous and holy before God, he begins to release all of the graces, all of the beautification, all of the goodness that he always intended for humanity. And through the blood of Jesus, covering a multitude of sins in our lives, he says, I now want to release to you and impart to you all the beauties of the new creation. I will start and go as far and as much of you that you will surrender and yield to me, as much of the good parts of you and as much of the bad parts of you, both being yielded and traded so that we can receive the beautification of the man Christ Jesus and become adorned and perfected and beautified and desirable to him and desiring him. So it's emotional realities being imparted. It's right thinking being imparted. It's right conduct. It's acts and deeds of righteousness. All of those things starting and culminating out of that reality that we see in John 15, being grafted into that vine through faith and then drawing his nature drinking and drawing his nature, which then turns into fruitfulness. It turns into to blossoms and fragrance and then fruitfulness. So we see Paul here saying, look, you Christians, we Christians, we have to be careful. We have to be careful, especially with the good things that we have in our heart, with the things that we've, we see that we should do and we have the capacity to do them. We ought to be very careful and make sure that we're coming from um, a reality where our first perspective is bridal. So what does that mean? What, is, what are the further implications of the, the culminating expression of the new covenant being a bride? It's not the army. And here, let me just uh, state this for, for a minute. 
there is a day, this is John the Baptist initiated the announcement of the new covenant when the man Jesus started to walk the earth. He initiated it through proclaiming that the bridegroom had come. And when his John the Baptist followers said, hey, they're going to that guy more than you now. He said, this isn't something to be upset about. The bridegroom is here. And he is now beginning to receive his bride, period. And he says, my joy is made full to see my acts of goodness, my usefulness, my value is diminishing greater and greater so that his value is now increasing. His visibility, his glory, his receiving what he has promised and what's been prophesied since the ages of old. Everything about him is now increasing. And so we see John the Baptist initiating the announcement of the new covenant with that. And then we see John the Beloved putting the capstone on the ages. And the capstone isn't anything other than the eternal reality of the believers of the body of Messiah that will extend through all the eternal ages are summed up as being his bride. In between, we've got, we've got wars and battles, we've got struggles, we have the realms of darkness, we've got uh, prophecies needed, all these things, intercession, all these things are needed for this transitional period while the Lord begins to fulfill and recreate, create his new creation starting with individuals. But what happens when the, the mean ones, when the dark ones are all chained and confined? What remains when there's no more labors of intercession, when all of the prophecy is fulfilled, all of it's been sealed up, it's been fulfilled? What remains? A relationship and an eternal reality of husband and wife remains forever and ever and ever. When we no longer have to be the army of God, we will be the wife of the lamb forever and ever. And so, and so initiating that, and apprehending that is coming into alignment again with our highest purpose and deepest, highest identity for the eternal ages. One which, as we know from the giving of the Holy Spirit, we don't have to wait for, we begin now. And as we begin to exist in it, it actually makes space and room for the Lord to put the pieces in place for him to come back because he said he's coming back for a bride. Now, so moving on there, what are some practical ways that we can relate to this situation? What can we do? How can we understand this reality of us making ourselves ready by receiving? And the thing that I'd like to uh, wrap up with is talking about our prayer life. When you study the Song of Songs, you find that she is, she's a person who already had a consciousness of loving the king, of, of being loved by the king. And she was given responsibility. She was given ministry. She was given tasks. She was given good things to do in the vineyard, uh, the vineyard of God, obviously. And what happens is in all her labors, she finds herself having become burnt out, discouraged, compromised and depleted the exact opposite of all of the promises of the new covenant in john 4 jesus said if you drink this water from me the water i have to give you then inside of you will become a well that will never run dry and you'll drink and drink and drink and draw from it and it will lead you to eternal life and Jesus is pulling from the prophecy of Jeremiah where he says, the new covenant soul, the soul in the new covenant will be a well-watered garden that he will cause the, his priests, the souls of his priests to be drunk, to be lavish, to be soaked. And he, he gives us that imagery. He gives us imagery in the Psalms that we will, we will draw from the torrents of his pleasure, from the raging rivers of his desire and pleasure that we will be filled, filled with his glory, that we will eat the fatness, the goodness of his house, that we will partake in the divine nature of God. All of these places in, in the prophetic scriptures where we're given glimpses and snapshots and, and fragrance so that we can understand what this covenant holds for us. 
she finds herself detached from that experience. And she finally comes to a place where she says, how can I do this? I'm burnt out. I'm depleted. Working in your vineyards has turned me into a burnout. She's, she's on the verge of depression. She's discouraged. She even tells those who are looking to follow her, don't even look at me anymore. I'm not worthy of, of leading you. And where he takes her, um, go ahead and turn to Song of Songs 2 now. He takes her in, back into the place where she must acknowledge that the only way she can receive what she needs is through the blood of Christ, putting her trust in a righteousness that comes through faith and being, having become settled into that faith again and seeing her compromise being covered by the blood of Jesus and, that, and it being purged and washed off of her, the cry in her heart for something more than she was able to find in her own strength comes forward and is met by an answer from him. And what we see is he begins to give her experiences in her devotion and in her everyday life where something that he created her for begins to open up like a fragrance out of her soul and becomes to testify and give her the experience of, that, of the new creation, gives her the, the, the experience of the lavished grace on her heart out of the new covenant. And the way that she describes it in chapter one, she says, when the king sits at my table, at the table, my perfume shoots forward, it opens up and it fills. And what she's saying is, wow, now when I come and I sit in my place and I gaze upon you, I think upon you, I pray. She's not coming with the to-do list for Jesus anymore. She's coming out of a desperation that the, her inner garden would be, would be filled and saturated, that she would walk into the promises that he gave her through his marriage proposal. And so as she begins to have these, these experiences, her heart is beginning to come alive. And it's coming alive because she finally is accepting and believing who her new creation identity is, the object of his affection, that she is being built and created to respond to his presence. When his presence comes, she's created in her new identity. Things happen. Things happen. Joy, peace, gladness, pleasure, ecstatic love, adoration. And what you see is she begins her walk where his presence becomes less, less initially less tied to being useful to him and, and attached to a functionality into a higher realm of usefulness, which is adoration and experiencing the reality of his promises. And it comes out of her and changes who she is. And ultimately she finds that it empowers her into greater abandonment, the abandonment that she hides from, into the profound depths of obedience, into a place where she can be a partaker of his sufferings and begin to taste of the powers of his rec resurrection, but to be so abandoned to him that she can now taste of his sufferings. And so uh, time check. I see that we're all, I'm going to take one more minute. We're going to read this passage from Song of Songs 2, and then we're going to button it up. So out of that beginning place where she has some of those introductory experiences, she proclaims this, I am the Rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valleys. And he responds to her. He's like, and you know, the lily of the valleys was kind of a common flower. He says, you're like a lily among thorns. So is my love among the daughters. He says, you're like a lily among thorns. You're not just a little flower. Everything else is thorns to me. And she says, well, like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. She says, you're the only one who has the fruit. You're the only one who has fruitfulness and delight. And she says, I sat down in his shade with great delight. His fruit was sweet to my taste. And the very next thing, that is her lavishing and delighting in his presence, in his cross, under the shade of his cross, and receiving the impartation of all the benefits of the cross flowing into the new creation identity. 
And in that place, it says, he brought me into the house of wine and his banner over me is love. He from that place is now set into, into the liberty to take her into the realm where she receives beautification and the deepening of the experiences. The experiences of, of, of that house of wine is what produces wisdom and zeal and might and steadfast love for him. Amen and amen. 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 Thanks so much, Todd. That was great. Um, just a great word, a great laying out of how the bride gets prepared. I just think that's a beautiful message. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, Steve Hawthorne is going to uh, share next. As uh, you know, part of the 10 days movement and a, a major prayer priority for us is praying for Matthew 24, 14 to be fulfilled and um, praying for the gospel of the kingdom to go to all nations. And, and within that, there's a particular focus on unreached people groups. Um, Steve has worked for years with uh, the group that used to be called the U.S. Center for World Missions uh, with the Perspectives course, which is a uh, like a missions introduction um, that's you know, happened all over the world. And uh, he's also worked, and I became familiar with him through his work with Waymakers um, and uh, some of the prayer guides he produced for the Global Day of Prayer. So, Steve, I know you've, you've done a lot of other things too, if you want to mention any of that, but um, we're really honored to have you here. We're thankful for Liz to Liz for inviting you and thinking of you, and we're just encouraged to, uh, to hear what you have to say. Yeah, well, my joy to be with you, and uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Scott, for that wonderful word. Uh, I'm amazed you're going to find what God put on my heart is utterly in sync with that, I think. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing more to be said about me. I just uh, have had a lot to do with the Perspectives course. Some people uh, listening or tuning in will have uh, experience with that, or if not, look into it. But... Um, I, uh, I, I, I want to, yes, Matthew 24, 14 is an important text. Um, but, and uh, Matthew 28, and we know that the world's got to be evangelized. You know, this gospel of the kingdom must be pro proclaimed as uh, a testimony, as a witness to all the peoples, is how it reads, every one of the ethne, and, uh, and then the end shall come. There's a lot we don't know. We don't know what's a sufficient testimony. We don't know. We don't really have a definitive list or God's list of the peoples. But we know that God's purpose involves all peoples. So what I'm going to be doing, and I'm going to be uh, working with two different uh, passages, which are uh, not usually what we come, uh, come from for uh, kind of a world evangelization or missions or outreach kind of thing. But um, I couldn't, uh, I, 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 I can't get over that this is uh, in, in a few hours uh, if it, in, in Israel, probably already, it's uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And uh, I want to, to begin, I'm going to read two different passages, some from Revelation 7 and some from Matthew 9. But, uh, but in Revelation 7, if you look, Look at it. I won't read the whole expanse of it, but it begins by the, uh, the listing out every one of the tribes of Israel and that they were numbered and there was 12,000. So there's a fullness of the house of Israel. But it's very interesting. It's always the tribes. And from the, from the very earliest moment where God had a covenant with his people, it was a, it was a covenant with a multiplicity of of tribes it was so it was multiple peoples or tribes but one people and so that's the way we've always been and so the exodus gathering we come up to the Sinai and, and we we covenanted with him to be his priests and his servants uh, that that was a multiplicity of peoples 
And so uh, John sees that in Revelation 7, to, filled to the utmost. But then look at verse 9. It says, after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation, all tribes, every people, and every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palm branches in their hands. Whoa, so here, there's an uncountable throng, but he can tell very clearly there's some from every single tribe and tongue and people. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, salvation. Now, I, I want to point out something. We have preached and we have uh, evangelized and we have learned that we're going to heaven and we got saved. To, so we can not go to the bad place and go to the good place and we should preach the gospel everywhere because people need to get saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell, saved from their, their, their sins. But look at what the great throng says. We, this great, incredible throng says, salvation to our God who sits in the throne and, and to the Lamb. If they don't say, look what we got saved from, look who we got saved to. Oh, we get saved into a relationship. And this is the way it's always been. <laughs> Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go. But he never said that. He never said, let my people go, period. He always said, let my people go, comma, that they may worship me, that they may serve me. It's always, in fact, one time even Pharaoh snapped back at Moses. He said, why should I let your people go that they may worship him? And so what well, God was making a spectacle of was not that slaves got loose, but that he was gaining to himself a people of worship. And that's what it was from the beginning, and that's what we shall exult in at the end of days. Salvation to our God, priests to our God. And then the, the, uh, the, 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 the elders and angels and all kinds of everybody say, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And then one of the elders says, John, who are, who's this great throng? And if, if you ever get taken up into heaven and asked a question, don't act like you know very much. So John, John, John was wise enough to say, say, uh, I don't know, you, you tell me, man. <laughs> and so, my Lord, you know, good answer. Listen what he, he was told. These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. Coming out, ongoing present tense. That's the Exodus language. This is the late great final Exodus from the great troubles. Don't, don't get all tangled up in the timings of this is the tribulation, this is not... Uh, it's just the great, the great troubles. The, we, this is the great throng of all humanity that is being led out. They're coming out. And what, but how are these Gentiles, these, these scummy, non-holy people, how do they become, you know, how do they get to worship God? How come they're white? They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are cleansed. And see, atonement is not just how I got forgiveness of sins. No, atonement's all about holiness in order to go near God. Look, look for it. It's, we, we get it wrong because we're always trying to just get saved from our sins. The point of atonement is to, is to be able to be holy and come near. And so that's why these Gentiles could never be, you know, a part of God's people because they were unholy. No, the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb. And this Day of Atonement, the blood of the Lamb, is so, so that the peoples from every tribe and tongue of people can make their robes white. And that's why it says in verse 15, for this reason, they're welcome before the throne of God. Whoa, not just in some temple, not just in some holy place, 
before the throne of God. And they serve him. That's worship him. That's priestly service. Day and night in his temple. And he who sits in the throne will extend his tabernacle near to them. Ah, ah. So that's who these peoples are. The people of God consists of some from every tribe and tongue and people. Any people group with generational depth. He has purchased some at extravagant cost. The blood of the sun? Are you kidding? What? Can you any up on that? Is there any greater cost? So, so the peoples God is gathering to become his people. And the most beautiful thing, as the, as the book rolls on, and uh, I, I just appreciate what, what, what Saudi was, was giving us about the bride, because the great city, the great city, she comes and she's made herself ready, and she is beautiful. She has the glory of God. And yet, the kings and the leaders of all the peoples everlastingly bring the glory and the honor of the peoples into that great city. There's something marvelous and splendid about how what every people can bring and offer, transformed in their culture and their language and their literature and their, their industry, their artistry. There's something gorgeous and marvelous. Of course, we're all perversed and broken and corrupt and, 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 and putrid in our cultural, but the blood of the lamb cleanses and changes every people group, every language, every people has something marvelous to bring and offer God for his joy, for his pleasure, because that's what it's all about. It's yes, get saved, but we're saved in order to serve and to please the one who's worthy. And so we should shout. And I'm going to ask us to pray that beautiful thing. Worthy is the lamb to receive. And, and the, the cry of worthy, there's a desire. In it. Oh, somehow when you cry worthy in the fullest way, you really, really want it for him. Come on, come on, son of God, get it all. He's worthy of it. Come on, Ooh, you want it for him. And so what mission is all about is loving God so much that you would labor along with others to see that he is loved. Yes, God loves the world, but the big thing is that he's gathering lovers. Jesus was asked, what's the main point of the Bible? Love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, strength. This can't be tangential. Now, 10%, let's hear a, little, a few factoids. Nearly 10% of the world's population, evangelical believers now, that's marvelous. 7.7 .7 billion people. About a third of the world's population are Christians of some kind or another. And Christians can, if they will, communicate with relevance and clarity to non-believers in their own culture and language. But we, but we have a difficulty connecting and, and persuading and, and, and relating to people uh, that are of a wildly different culture or different, uh, different style and way. And, uh, and so we, that's what we call different cultures that have generational depths to them, people groups. Not every group of people is a people group. The bowling league, for example, on Thursday night is not a people group. Uh, we don't plan a church for the bowling league. Well, we, we have special outreach efforts to the bowling league on Thursday night. But the people groups have generational, ongoing clarity and, 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 and endurance. And so half the non-believers, half of all non-believers live in groups that are culturally distant from believers. Then, uh, there are no believers. And so we call those people groups uh, unreached. I kind of think the better term, and we knew it when we started at this in the 1970s, was actually unchurched. Because the point is not that nobody from outside has reached them, because the point is not 
us talking and telling our message to them. The point is that Christ shall be loved and served and worshiped and followed. That's the point. Disciplize the, 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 the ethnicities Jesus gave us that task. And what, what's the point of that? Teaching them to obey me. Oh, marvelous. So it's about, it's about God getting served. But the problem is, is not that the people groups have not heard the gospel. That's a problem. But what's really the issue is they have not seen what it looks like for Christ to be followed in their culture, in their family style. And so it's alien, it's political, it's, it's rude, it's rash, and it's other than us. And I would, I would, it would be, I, 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 I would shame my entire family if I joined these Christians. And they know what Christians are like. They watch t television from America all, and Hollywood all over the world. So, so the real problem is not that they haven't heard, but they haven't seen how Christ can be followed in their ethnicity and be praised and served in their language and in their ways. So, uh, it, so it, they live in what we call Omri's people groups. And uh, a global summary, there's about 17,000 people groups in all the world of all sorts and kinds. Unreached people groups, about 7,500. 7,500 people groups in which there are not a sufficient number of Christian followers of believers that could potentially, even possibly, bring the gospel in a clear, about, uh, connecting way to bring about movements that follow Christ. And so that's, that's a lot of people. In fact, um, there's, there's about, uh, 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 about three, and, uh, three and a half billion people that are individuals that are part of unreached people groups. That's a lot of people. And I, I get confused on numbers sometimes. I'm not a numbers guy. Um, but the real issue is not that these people have not yet heard or seen the Christ follow. The real issue is that they never will unless something changes. Something's got to change. Present day mission efforts. Some people generously count that the missionaries now sending out and we're doing great work, yes. But, but amongst Armory's peoples, our missionary count is somewhere between one in 10 or one in 30. Most of our missionaries are going to places where there already are churches thriving and abounding, and that's wonderful. Now, so, so who are these different peoples? We don't have time to go into the, some of the lists, but the, some of the unreached peoples are, are, are caste groups in India, different tribal groups with no translation uh, of the Bible whatsoever. They're, and the Jewish people, there's different clans and communities. Yes, we're, we see followers that can potentially trace their lineage back to the 12 tribes, but in fact, we see different kind of communities and clans uh, in some of the Jewish peoples with generational depths. They connect us in an ongoing community. They are not yet, uh, they, they, they've not ha had a telling of the gospel that helps them see that they can follow Christ without abandoning and rejecting their, their family. See, Christ did not die for Muslims to eat a ham sandwich. Yeah. And yet many of them are quite sure they would have to uh, eat a ham sandwich and drink a beer to become a Christian. And, and so that's the world in which we live. How should we pray? What should we do? Yes, there, there's need for thousands yet more missionaries. And to be, to, be, to be encouraged, I wanted to let you know there are greater surges of movements amongst unreached people more in the last 20 years than ever before. More Muslims have come to Christ in the last 20 years than in, in all the centuries before uh, the, the, the year 1980. 
That's astounding. So God is moving great ways. I want to take us to um, uh, Matthew 9. Jesus um, speaking, Matthew 9, middle of his ministries with his followers. And verse 36 says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed. They were dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Now, how, how, did, how did Matthew know to write this? They didn't just look over at Jesus and you know, 12 go, whoa, look, he's feeling really compassionate. Yeah, he always does his face like this. When, but no, Jesus told them. He said, you know, guys, as I'm looking at this, I got to tell you, there's, there's, a, there's a deep, profound compassion moving in me. Here's, let me tell you how I see you. They're like sheep without a shepherd, distressed. So there was that compassion, yes. But then it's amazing Jesus does not tell them, guys, let's go out there and be shepherds. Come on, do something because we care for them because we have so much compassion and care. No, the way Jesus does mission is different. Look at the next lines. Then he said, okay, here's what to do. Feel the compassion, but I want you to, here's how we're going to act. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Therefore, beseech, pray hardy, that the Lord of the harvest is to send out workers into his harvest. What he did next described was this. There's a harvest out there. Look again. See those people, those lost sheep? No. Think of it as a harvest. Think of it as fields that are white to harvest. They're already alive. There's already fruit abounding. This is God's doing. He already started something. This is something every missionary finds is that they're never first. We're always late to the party. God has got something going and he brings forth life. And what this means, what Jesus is doing, and, and this is the way of all mission. We preach to try to make ourselves feel guilty and, and dutiful and do something. But no, we get to collaborate with the living God. In his harvest. That's what he said. Jesus said, Jesus' words are not the harvest. No, it's his harvest. That they would be saved to him. To be his worship servants. To be his lovers. To be his children. It's for him. It's his harvest. Not ours. And so, we get to collaborate with the living God. The ancient of days. That he gives us, he grants us, he entrusts us. Does it make us with clear ways that we can bear, bring forth fruit to him from the harvest? The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. So we're going to, uh, I'd like us to pray in two different ways as we move into a time of prayer. Please pray with us. Don't just listen to prayers. Get into it with us. Let's, let's get this. I, I, I don't know which we do it. There'll be others uh, praying as well. So I don't want to you know, limit anything. But, uh, but for us to pray for God's people to have compassion, to share the compassion of Jesus, but to pray that we, that the Lord of the harvest, we collaborate with him. And that he would send out workers into his harvest. By the way, we've learned praying that verse does not mean pray that God sends people from Australia and England and America. Now, what we've learned is to, while we're in Indonesia, we're, we're in Nepal, we pray that God would send out people from a, a Nepali village to the rest of the valley. But there's no believers yet. No, that's fine. He's already got something alive. And so we've learned it's not to send us Westerners out there. It's we're praying, God, send out your laborers into this harvest. You can bring them forth. You can call them to life. So let's pray that God would have had to send a, a mighty sending. But let's also pray for compassion. But I guess there's three ways to pray. And then we could pray worthy, Lamb of God, get it all. And, and uh, it's, uh, it may be more praise than prayer, but let's let God sort that out. 
He's going to get all. He will not fail. This must come forth. The Lamb of God has purchased them. The most expensive part has already been done. And now we're just asking, Lord of the harvest, that's the risen Lord. Get it done for your son. Amen. So I'll, I'll leave it there. So Jonathan, Grant, anybody? Should we just pray or you want me to uh, sat and I pray or what? Yeah, let's, um, let's just take um, just five minutes for prayer and then we're going to have a few announcements. So um, Steve, um, yeah, what, let's, let's start with you and Sot and then let's just open it up to the group here. That'd be great. Okay, worthy Lamb of God, you're worthy of a bride drawn to you at great cost. And on this day of atonement, Lamb of God, we exalt that, there's, that we can come before you as, as holy uh, in robes of white. But also, Lord, we pray for the, the, the garments of fine linen for the bride. The bride consists of, of all the peoples bringing their, their joy and their glories into the city. And so we, 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 we say, Lord Jesus, you're worthy of all the worship. Within the days of history, yes, we, we look forward to the eternity that shall come forth. But oh, that you would get it done for the Son in these days. And so we pray, Lord, Lord Jesus, as Lord of the harvest, would you somehow give us a heart transplant that we could know and sense your compassion? These are your sheep. You, you, told, you told Peter, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Care for my sheep. Care for my lambs. And they're yours, Lord Jesus. You purchased them. And so we pray for our hearts to be moved like yours. Come on, Lord of the harvest. Send out your new laborers. Send out thousands. Why not do it swiftly? And, and so there's a spectacle. And so that people all over the world are just astounded. And the, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, it just covers everything like the waters cover the sea. Amen. Amen. And all, I'd like to pray out of Ephesians 3. And we praise you, Father. You are the origination of the whole family in yeah. heaven and on earth. And right now, we release the spirit of might into your people. We lean in understanding that you desire to release the jet fuel to propel us further and deeper, that we are totally reliant on your spirit to release divine power inside of us. And so we ask you to do it. We believe so that Christ can dwell in our hearts through faith, that you would release the dynamic power from your spirit that will cause us to be convinced and live out of a conviction that Christ is inside of our hearts, dwelling in us, that you would begin to create new thoughts, new desires, mm -hmm. new patterns of understanding, create your new creation in us. We will, not, we will not have trouble going when you send. And for that, we lean into our dependency for you to release that power inside of us to create anything, to will and to work for the good pleasure of your Father. Yes. So that we would become the fullness of God. We would be filled with the fullness. Filled with the fullness. And in this fullness, you will go so far above and beyond our expectations, anything that we could even ask or pray for. We are dependent on your spirit of might being released into the hearts, into the inner beings of your believers. We have total faith and confidence in you, creator, 
to create everything, every deed, every desire, every thought, every renewed mind, every emotion, everything that we need to fulfill your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Lord. Thank you for just these teachings, just so appropriate to have them at this juncture of 10 days, Lord, as we've been pouring out. And now we are asking you to pour into us, to fill us up and to make us stronger and to uh, prepare us, Father, uh, to be your spotless bride. And also that comes with with this heart for the lost, this heart for prayer and, and a heart for the lost, to win the lost, Lord, hallelujah, that we would just not to be a people of prayer, but we'd be a people of prayer and witness, Father. We thank you, Lord. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just pray for release of a spirit of prayer on your people. Uh, Lord, I know in times of great harvest, there's just often been a release of a great spirit of prayer uh, for those who do not know you. Lord, and we just pray that you would release that over your people in these days. In Jesus' name.